Welcome, welcome, welcome. We're glad you chose to be with us again. Thank God, I thank God for you. Those who are watching from home, God sees you. We might not see you right now, but God sees you and you're very, very special to this God. Thank you for choosing to be with us. We're still dealing with this glimpse of tomorrow. What does the future hold? You're going to see something big right now. We're going to deal with another prophecy. Before I do so, though, I need to ask you a question. Do you, do, does anybody know this, this person here? In fact, it's a massive statue. Tells us that he is a very important person. Anybody has an idea, any idea who this guy is, who this person is? This is Aristotle. Wow, the great Greek philosopher. You know what he said one day? It, it was about in the year three, 350 BC, Aristotle said that the spider has six legs. And guess what? Everybody believed him. Why? Because it's a Greek philosopher who said so. Nobody really questioned this man. And so for centuries, people just believed him. Nobody verified his findings. No one took some time to do some research until out of nowhere came James Lamarck, someone who studied the details of insects. So James decided to spend some time and to just count the number of legs uh, this spider has. And guess what? How many legs? Eight legs. Wow, eight legs. Well, friends, in this presentation right now, you will learn that there are millions of people who have been deceived by another lie. One that is much worse than that of the spider having six legs. For throughout the century, you will see this today, throughout the century, millions of people, sincere people, have been going to church on Sunday without realizing that Sunday worship is not biblical. For nowhere in Scripture are we called to worship God on Sunday. In our last presentation, for those who have been following, we already saw that the seventh day is Saturday instead of Sunday. So the big question is this, why is it that today the majority of people are worshiping God on Sunday? And as we have already seen, many of these people are lovely people, great Christians. Some have been born again, spirit-filled people. So why is it they're keeping the wrong day? Well, in our study today, we will catch a glimpse of what has happened within the Christian church. We will learn that there was a change that took place during a period in the history of the Christian church called the Dark Age. A change, by the way, that Satan himself had orchestrated under cover through a system, a religious system that would try to change God's law, including the fourth commandment, the Sabbath day. And for a hundred years, or for hundreds of years, such a change has been covered up in Christianity without the majority of people knowing it. So let's study about this most important topic. The title is The Greatest Counterfeit in Christianity. Let us pray. Father in heaven, thank you that you've brought us again today in your word to study the Bible especially to study about this most important prophecy, helping us to understand what has happened in the past, how the enemy has worked so much to deceive people. Guide us, God. Help us to understand why the deception, why is it that many people are keeping the wrong day, even though they love you. Guide us at this time. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. My dear friends, let me ask you this question. If you would have a daughter and you really love her and you see that your daughter is going out with a crazy guy, someone who's been doing the wrong things, maybe he's been beating up other people, what would you do if you see your daughter going out with that guy? 
Would you just let your daughter just go out with that person? Or would you warn her? Just think about that. Of course, you will warn her. Am I right? Why will you do this? In fact, the more you love her, the greater will be the warning. Am I right? And the bigger the danger, the more urgent will be your warning. Am I right? Well, today God will warn us of the coming of a little horn. The coming of a dangerous system who would come into existence in order to deceive many people in the last days. To turn them away from God, away from His Word, away from His law, and to man's tradition. As a result, they will eventually lose these millions of years we've been talking about in eternity that Jesus went to prepare for us. So let's study this most important prophecy. For the Bible says that one night, Daniel himself had had a dream. In fact, his dream was about beast coming up out of the water. Let us read it. Daniel chapter 7 from verse 2 and onwards. And I saw in my vision by night, and behold, the four winds of heaven were stirring up the great sea. Always stirring up the great sea. And four great beasts came up from the sea, each different from the other. So my dear friends, what is God trying to tell us right now about beast and sea? Don't forget it's a prophecy. So it's not literal. What does these, or what do these things represent, these animals and the sea? Let the Bible itself give us the key, okay? What does water represent in the Bible? Well, Revelation 17, verse 15, the Bible says, The waters which you saw are peoples, multitudes, nations, and tongues. In other words, according to the book of Revelation, which is another book of prophecy, we will deal with this book. Please don't miss what we're going to study from this book. It will blow your mind away. Well, according to the book of Revelation, water represents populated areas. Okay, so this beast came out from a place where there were lots of people living. What does beast means now or represent in the Bible? Let's go back to Daniel chapter 7 verse 17. Those great beasts which are four are four kings which arise out of the earth. So the beast that we're seeing represents kings. We read, the fourth beast shall be a fourth kingdom on earth. So beast in the Bible can represent kings or kingdoms or nations. In other words, in this prophecy, these four beasts represent certain nations that will come into existence out from a populated area. I hope you're following very carefully. Notice how Daniel describes them. He says, the first was like a lion and had eagle wings. So Daniel saw an, an animal, a beast like a lion. And then notice, and suddenly another beast, a second like a bear. It was raised up on one side and had three ribs in its mouth between its teeth. So that's basically what Daniel saw. And then there was another beast. After this, I looked and there was another like a leopard, which had on its back four wings of a bird. Very strange kinds of animals. Another one. After this, in the night visions, and behold, a fourth beast, dreadful and terrible, exceedingly strong. It had huge iron teeth. Note this, iron. It was devouring, breaking in pieces, and trampling the residue with its feet. It was different from all the beasts that were before it, and it had ten horns. Wow! So what type of animals are these? What do they represent? Wow, what a zoo! Notice each beast are not ordinary beasts. They all have some special characteristics that help us to understand the vision. So my question to you right now is this, what comes to your mind when you hear about four? 
beast or four nations, four empires, four kingdoms, and you've heard something about iron, what comes to your mind? It's Daniel chapter 2, the statue of Daniel chapter 2. Wow, you remember that? For the head represents what? Babylon in 605, the head of gold. And then the chest of, uh, of silver represents Medo-Persia in 539 before Christ. And then the thigh of bronze represents the kingdom of Greece in 331. And then we have Rome here. And then at the end we have Europe, divided Europe. And then we, of course, we see the stone, so the stone coming to hit the whole thing. In other words, my dear friends, Daniel 7 is directly connected with Daniel chapter 2. It's these same nations as we saw in Daniel chapter 2. But here, of course, you will see that God will give more information of what will take place just before Jesus returns. Are you following? Yes. So here we will learn more of what will take place here at the bottom. So let's go again briefly uh, through the four kingdoms. Okay? There it is. The lion represents Babylon. Okay? The head of gold. 605. And then the bear, Medo-Persia. Of course, there are more information. I don't have time to go through it. For example, they have wings which represent swiftness. How Babylon was so rapid to capture its prey. And then this one here, it had ribs in the mouth representing those nations, the three nations that, that, that uh, um, Medo-Persia conquered. Here we have um, four heads representing the general of, uh, of um, Alexander the Great. There were four of them. It's amazing. I wish I could just study with you for you to be blown away because history tells us that after Alexander uh, the Great died, his, his kingdom was divided into four by, in regards to his four generals. We don't have time to go through that. And then we come here. So here it's Babylon, and here it's Medo-Persia, here it's Greece, and here we come to Rome. We want to pay particular attention to Rome because the Bible says that Rome is this terrible beast here. Notice what it says. It was different from any of the other beasts, and it had how many, how many horns? 10 horns, wow, 10 horns? Out of this kingdom are ten kings that shall arise. What comes to your mind when you hear about ten? The ten toes. Do you see that? So Rome will give rise to ten European nations. Wow, there it is. Ten. Coming up here. Europe divided. The ten nations of Europe in 476 after Christ. Rome went down and gave rise to Europe divided. So clearly, my dear friends, Daniel chapter 7 is related to the last days. You've got to get this right. Now listen to what the Bible says. Daniel 7 now. Daniel 7, it says, verse 8, I considered the horns, and behold, there came up among them another little horn. Whoa! Do you see that? It's as if there was another extra toe that came out among the 10 that you have. Are you there? So friends, you will see that this little horn here is not like the others. It's a dangerous one, by the way. And this little horn will come into existence just before Jesus returns. In fact, so dangerous was the little horn. Listen to what Daniel said. I, Daniel, was grieved in my spirit and the visions of my head troubled me. Mm. I was deeply troubled by my thoughts and my face turned pale. Why was Daniel troubled? Do you know why? Notice what this little horn will do. Notice this. The same horn made war with the saints. Whoa. It is a system that will persecute the saints. In the Bible, saints simply means people of God. Children of God, those who have left the world and they are following Jesus. They've given their hearts to Jesus. Can we say amen? So this system will attack and persecute the children of God and prevail against them. And secondly, he shall speak great words against the Most High. It is a system that will speak against God. And then the Bible says it is a system that will think to change what? 
times and laws. So Daniel, when he sees this, he starts to panic. He starts to tremble. He realizes that this system is a very dangerous one. For it is a system that is having problems. It is not only a secular system anymore. It is someone that is dealing with God and his character and his law and with his people. And so he, 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 he trembles. He turns pale. He realizes that this is a hostile religious power that the enemy Satan will use in these last days to turn people away from God and to men. Are you following but right now, you will see that because God loves people and because God wants to save people, He will bring this prophecy so as to warn us of the danger of this religious system. My big question to you right now is this. Who is this little horn? Who is he? Well, you don't need to guess the answer. Because the Bible gives us enough information so that we can know who the little horn is. We're going to see what the Bible says and we're going to see what history says. Okay? So let us tie up or let us buckle up our belt and see what the Bible says about this little horn. I'll give you a few characteristics. As I was looking at the ten horns suddenly another small horn appear among them. Notice when, the, when did the little horn come into existence. Three of the first horn were torn out by the roots to make room for it. So notice what is happening. That little horn came after the ten little horns had already established itself. And then the Bible says, that three of the first horns were torn out. So when that little horn came, three of the previous horns were torn out. And you know what the ten horns are all about. We've already studied this, okay? The, the European nations, the Western European nations, okay? If we go on the map today, we will not find these three, Heruli, Vandals, and Ostrogoths. Whereas you will see the other seven, they are still remaining. So what has happened? We will see this very shortly. Let's continue to read. This little horn had eyes like human eyes and a mouth that was boasting arrogantly. Mmm. So we've already seen that little horn will come after the ten horns had already established itself. After 476, in other words. Okay? And it will come among the ten horns. It will come from Rome. So please don't miss this characteristics okay and here it says something more and then we saw three of the little horns those nations from Europe will be uprooted because of that little horn so bear in mind those characteristics and then here it says this little horn had eyes like human eyes and a mouth that was boasting arrogantly what does that mean it means that there's a man who is at the heart of this system or at the head of this system. The same horn was making war against the saints and prevailed against them. They will persecute God's children. The ten horns are, the te are ten kings who shall arise from this kingdom and another shall arise after them. Okay, notice clearly, the little horn will come into existence only, I repeat this again, only after the ten European nations have already been established after 476 AD, okay? And it says here, he shall be different from the first ones and shall subdue three kings. Different, why? Because this time it's not only a secular power, it is a religious power. It's dealing with God, it's dealing with his people, it's dealing with the laws of God, are you following? Mm. And it subdues three kings. Let's move on. He shall speak pompous words. Mm. Before we just saw, he, he, it will, he will speak arrogantly. Hmm? He shall speak pompous word, words against the Most High. Uh, like I just said, pompous words in Revelation, you will hear it's all about blasphemy. It will blaspheme. This little horn will blaspheme against God. In fact, let me read it right there. Revelation 13 verse 5 
talking about that same, this same system, Bible says, and he was given a mouth speaking great things and what? There it is. Blasphemies. I'm asking you right now, what does blasphemy mean in the Bible? I'll give you three meanings. Are you ready? First of all. So while I give you three meanings, I want you to think, okay? God has given us a mind to think, okay, so that we can understand things. First, notice they were accusing Jesus for blasphemy. Three times you will see that in the Gospels. This is one of them. Mark chapter 2 verse 7. Why does this fellow talk like that? People, the Pharisees, they were mad at Jesus. They say, why is he talking like that? He is blaspheming. Why do you think they're saying that he was blaspheming? There it is. Who can forgive sins but God alone? In the Bible, blasphemy means when you claim you can forgive the sins of people. Are you following? In other words, the little horn will claim on earth just before Jesus returns that he has the right to forgive the sins of man. That's what blasphemy is all about. So think a little about, uh, think a little bit about that, about which religious system claims to have this power to forgive the sins of man. Another one, John 10, 36. Still against Jesus, the Pharisees were still against Jesus. They said, why then do you accuse me of blasphemy? Because I said, I am God's son. Second one, you want to blaspheme against God? You just claim that you are the son of God on earth. So this system run by a man at the head of it will claim that he's the son of God on earth. That's blasphemy. Let me give you a third one. John 10 verse 33. We're not stoning you. The Pharisees, they're talking to Jesus. We're not stoning you for any of these, replied the Jews, but for blasphemy. Why? Because you, a mere man, claim to be what? God. Did you hear that? So you just think about that. Which religious power, through its leader, claims to be the Son of God on earth, God Himself on earth, and has the right to forgive the sins of man? Think about that. Let's continue. He shall persecute the saints of the Most High God and shall intend to change times and laws. This is our big one now. That system will try to change the laws of God. What comes to your mind when you think about the law? The Sabbath has been changed. Wow. So it's a system who will persecute God's children and at the same time will try to change the laws of God. And this is where this, you see the Sabbath has been changed from Saturday to Sunday. Notice the Bible continues. Then the saints shall be given into his hand for a time and times and half a time. So the Bible also gives us the duration of this power on earth where he will be controlling in Europe and persecuting the Christians and changing the word of God. Let us do the calculation by the way. Time in the Jewish calendar means a year and at that time a year represented 360 days. Times means two years, which means two times 360, which is 720 days. Half a time, it's half of 360 days, which is equal to 180 days. Now you add up all of these, you will get what? 100, or oh, pardon me, 1,260 days. Is this clear? But now you know in prophecy, a prophetical day is equal to one year. Please note this down, very important. We're dealing with prophecy here. So the Bible is, in fact, maybe I'll give you a text. I have appointed you one day for what? For each year, amen. So here, the Bible is saying that this system will rule, will command, will be in control for over 1,260 years. Mm, in other words, that religious system will persecute the Christians and dominate Europe, especially Western Europe, and it will think to change the laws of God within this period of time. So my question right now is this, who is this little horn? 
that came from Rome, pagan Rome, that came after those 10 European nations had been established in Western Europe. Who's the little horn? That little horn that was so different, it was not only a secular system, but it was a religious system. Just think a little bit. Where its leader claims to be Christ on earth, God on earth, and has the power to forgive the sins of men, which is the system that had changed the laws of God, including the Sabbath. Wow, anybody knows? Exactly. It is Papal Rome. It is the Roman Church. This prophecy falls on the Roman Church. Papal Rome will replace pagan Rome. And please, please remember that the Bible is not attacking people right now. Amen? God is talking about a system. In fact, in the book of Revelation, God says that He has His people still in this religious system. God has many of His people in the Roman church. So please get this right. God is not attacking people. God loves people. Can we say amen? For God so loved the world that He gave His only begotten Son. God is warning us of a system that Satan will put in place to divert people away from God to men, away from the laws of God, to men's traditions, pagan traditions. Let's go quickly through these characteristics and see it for ourselves. For example, the first one, the little horn came from Western Europe. Among the 10 European nations, it came out of Rome. Where did the Roman church come from? From Rome, so it's not a big problem. Second, the little horn will come into existence only after the 10 European nations have already been established. That is, after 476 uh, AD. When did Rome come into existence? Well, you will see, my dear friends, it came after 476. In, in fact, to be precise, it came at f around 538 80. We will see this later. Let's see the other one. It would destroy three of the ten European nations of that time, which is what? The Herolites, the Vandals, and the Ostrogoths. You can go and check it on the internet. You will see that these three nations, the Ostrogoths, the Heroli, and the Vandals, they were a thorn in the flesh of the Roman church. And so finally, they had to be uprooted by that system helped by pagan Rome. And eventually, these three were replaced by papal Rome. Are you following? Wow. Check it on the internet and you will be blown away. Fourthly, this power will be different to the other ten nations. It will be both political and a religious power. Why do I say that? Well, notice most countries have had an ambassador representing them in Vatican. Did you know that? I've visited Vatican. I've done a little bit of research there too. And amazingly, I was shocked to see that most countries have an ambassador representing them there. Why do you need an ambassador to represent you? Because the Vatican is more than a religion. It is also a state, a political state. It is a religion, of course, but it is also a political state. So it does both. Okay, notice fifth one. This power will persecute the Christians. Mm. Did Rome, the Roman church, persecute the Christians? There's a lot to be said about that. You can go into, onto, onto the internet. You will see many things. Very sad things have happened during the dark age. Many people have died under this religious power. Some historians have even labeled They've written and, and claim that this religious system have killed over 50 to 150 million Christians and people. Can you believe that? Well, this is because at that time when the Roman church was in power, they were coming up with their own traditions and teachings. And people were forced 
to obey and to follow the church and to accept the church as the means of salvation, to accept the teachings of the church as coming from God. And as a result, millions were killed. We don't have time to go into details, my dear friends, but it is a sad thing that has happened. In fact, Paul, John Paul, before he died, he had confessed this. Last time, even the present Pope Francis had confessed what the church had done, those atrocious crimes the church had done. It is real. History confirms exactly what the Bible is saying. It's amazing. Let's move on. He will speak pompous words against the Most High, the Bible says. What is pompous word? I told you that. Blasphemy in, in Revelation, pompous words or arrogantly means he will speak blasphemy. I ask you right now, which religious system through its priest or its leaders claim to have the power to forgive the sins of men? Hmm? It's the Roman church. You see that? Now, what about claiming to be the son of God on earth? Did you know that Rome claims that the Pope represents Christ on earth? And that's blasphemy. Let me share some things with you, my dear friends. Notice it's not, it's, it's not the Protestant church that writes this. That's the Roman church. They say the poor, they're talking about what happens when somebody's confessing his or her sin before the priest or before the church leader. The poor sinner kneels at his confessor's feet. He knows that he is not speaking to an ordinary man, but to another Christ. Are you following? That's blasphemy. If you want to know where I, I took this, here it is. So you can take a picture and go and check for yourself. He hears the word, I absolve your sins or thy sins, and the hidden Lord of sin drops from his soul forever. Wow. Let me give you another quote. The Pope is of so great a dignity and so exalted that he is not a mere man, but as it were God and the vicar of God. You know what vicar of God means? The representative of God on earth, the substitute of God on earth. And this is what they're saying. The Roman church is saying about the Pope. That's the, that, that's the reference here. The Pope is as it were the vicar of God on earth, chief king of kings having plentitude of power. According to the Bible, who's the chief king of kings? Jesus. But unfortunately, the Roman church claims that it is the Pope that is the vicar, the representative, the substitute of God on earth. And this is what? Blasphemy. Let me give you another quote, again from the same church. We hold upon this earth the place of God Almighty. But the supreme teacher in the church is the Roman pontiff, the Pope. Union of minds, therefore, requires together with a perfect accord in the one faith, complete submission and obedience of the will to the church and the Roman pontiff as to God himself. Wow, that's blasphemy. And then the Pope, there's another one. The Pope is not only, listen to this one, the Pope is not only the representative of Jesus Christ, but he is Jesus Christ himself, hidden under the veil of the flesh, or the veil of flesh. Wow, this is what? This is blasphemy. So the little horn can be known. Now notice this one. This kingdom would attempt to change God's laws. Does Rome... Papal Rome accepts that. Listen to this. I've taken this from the catechism, from the Roman church. How did the Christian day of worship change from Saturday to Sunday? Listen to what Rome will say. The Catholic catechism of doctrine says, question, which is the Sabbath day? They answer, Saturday is the Sabbath day. Question, why do we observe Sunday instead of Saturday? We observe Sunday instead of Saturday because the Catholic Church in the Council of Laodicea transferred the solemnity from Saturday to Sunday. You see, the church admits that they've made that change. You may read, they say, 
uh, the Bible from Genesis to Revelation, and you will not find a single line authorizing the sanctification of Sunday, the keeping of Sunday. The scriptures enforce the religious observance of Saturday, a day which we never sanctify. And this is from Cardinal Gibbons. They admit that Sunday keeping is not from the Bible. And so question, what Bible authority is there for changing the Sabbath from the seventh day to the first day of the week? Who gave the Pope the authority to change a commandment of God? So the question was asked to them. Answer, if the Bible, that's what they say, if the Bible is the only guide for the Christian, then the Seventh-day Adventist is right in observing Saturday with a Jew. Wow! So they admit that the Seventh-day Adventist Church, they are right to keep Saturday as their Sabbath as the Jew. Now the question is this, if Sunday is not part of Scriptures, what does it symbolize? Do you know what it symbolizes? Listen to what Jesus says, Mark 7, verse 7 and 8. And in vain they worship me, teaching as doctrines the commandments of man. Sunday keeping is a commandment of man. In fact, Jesus goes further. For laying aside the commandment of God, you hold the tradition of man. Sunday keeping, my dear friend, or Sunday worship is a pagan tradition. For the pagan used to worship the sun god, their main sun. And this practice, unfortunately, entered Christianity through the Roman emperor known as Constantine. Now prepare yourself for the shock of your life. For the Bible says that the Roman church would rule for a period of 1,260 years. Does history confirm this truth? Notice. This kingdom would rule for a period of 1,260 years. In 538, notice this date, the Ostrogoths, the last of the ten tribes to oppose the Roman church. Ostrogoth, it's among the three that was uprooted, or uprooted. The Ostrogoths, the last of the ten tribes to oppose the Roman church, were overthrown in the year 538. There it is. Now notice. In 1798, Napoleon's general, Berthier, broke the Roman church's political power in the year 1798. If you study history, that was the time that the Pope was sent to prison in the, on this time. You take this year and you minus this, what do you get, my friends? 1,260 years. What do we say? Isn't this amazing? I tell you, the Bible is true. We can trust the Word of God. Amen? The Bible is accurate, my dear friends. And then the Bible says that a man is at the head of this kingdom. My dear friends, of course, we have the Pope, which is at the head of this kingdom. There's always been a Pope at the head of the Roman Church. My dear friends, do you see how God loves us? To give us a profound truth. He does not want anybody to be lost by errors, by the pagan traditions. For it's the truth that sets us free. Can we say amen? It's the truth that saves. For Jesus says, I am the way, the truth, and life. And this is what the Bible is saying right now. It's not the preacher. It's God himself because God loves us. So my dear friends, Daniel had been given a glimpse of what would happen in the future. And today God gives this dream to us and history confirms that it has happened. Oh, my dear friends, never forget, God is talking about a system here. It's not talking about people. God has his people everywhere in every denomination. Did you know that? God has his people in the Catholic Church in the Pentecostal church, in the Muslim community, in the Hindu community. God has His people everywhere. But God wants them to know the truth so that they can choose to follow Jesus and prepare themselves for eternity. It's the system that is in trouble. It is a system that Satan has used 
in order to deceive the world with a counterfeit Sabbath. Satan is a great deceiver. And that is why right now, God is asking you, as you ponder upon the return of Jesus, God is calling you back to the Bible, back to the Ten Commandments, back to the Sabbath, to keep the Sabbath holy. Amen? If you love me, Jesus says, keep my commandments. Do you love Jesus? I invite you to start keeping God's commandments. It's not enough to simply say, I love Jesus. A disciple is somebody who obeys God's commandments. Is this your desire? Those who are listening at home, is this your desire? Let us pray. Father, thank you for this prophecy. Oh God, thank you for loving us to warn us of the coming of this system. Thank you that you've clarified it's not about people, it's about a system. God, give us the grace that we need to come out of error, to come out of sinful practices, of those traditions that we've been keeping, thinking that they were from you. Now we understand more, God. Help us to be faithful not only to Jesus, but to His commandments. And help us to start keeping these commandments, not because we're afraid of hell, but because we love you. Give us Jesus as we go home today, and may Jesus works in our lives to make us become more like him as we choose to obey his word. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. Amen. amen.